On behalf of IEEE MBS conference, uh, I would like to appreciate your presence. We are delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Emilio Bitze uh, from MIT. Uh, Emilio, as you know, has both PhD and MD. He received his MD degree, actually, when I was born, 1958. And then he became associate professor, docent. And then uh, he moved to United States. He worked several places. And he was, he's currently institute professor. Emilio, correct me if I make a mistake. Uh, and he was the chair of cognitive and brain science department for a number of years. And he was also leading Whitaker Institute at MIT. He significantly contributed uh, to field of neuroscience, and he spent a lot of time, and he's the leading person to understand how brain activates, monitors, controls the motion and movement. And also his group is leading to develop uh, actually the advanced neural processes uh, currently in his lab. Emilio is, although he significantly contributed to field, as I mentioned, he's also a great mentor. He uh, advised unknown number of the PhD students, and <laughs> we really appreciate for that because we care about education, of course. Uh, he's a member of National Academy of Science, National Academy of the Arts. He was also the president for a number of the years, and also he he's a member of Italian Academy, De Lencia, and he received the gold medal by the Italian president, uh, in addition to many awards. That is one of them I remember, Humboldt Award. Uh, it's, he contributed to hundreds of papers, textbooks. Uh, he's an icon in the field of neuroscience. We are honored, delighted having you, my dear friend. <laughs> Thank you so much. For coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for your very generous uh, introduction. Um, so what I would like to discuss today is uh, the modularity of um, the motor system and what kind of uh, problems are being solved by uh, the modularity. Uh, I would predominantly focus on uh, the biological aspect of uh, this problem. And um, I will start by um, and, um, so th this uh, uh, picture from uh, any textbook of um, uh, physiology shows the uh, motor system. Uh, the, cortical portion of the motor system, the basal ganglia, cerebellum, and spinal cord. Okay, so this uh, uh, system, as everybody knows, is highly interconnected. And it looks as if it is uh, hierarchically organized, but uh, that is uh, uh, only partly true. In a sense that, uh, as uh, Abfetz has shown a few years ago, the uh, neurons of uh, the spinal cord, the interneurons of the spinal, some of the interneurons of the spinal cord, receive activities uh, and information and signals from the cortex prior to the uh, cell the activity of the cells of the primary motor cortex. So that is one of the example of uh, the profound way in which the motor system is uh, interconnected through loops that, um, in, in a sense, uh, complement and somewhat defy the hierarchical organization. Now, this system, the motor system, handles uh, superbly in the vertebrate, in all the vertebrate systems, a large number of muscles. In uh, the higher vertebrates, the number of muscles had been it's roughly 600. But uh, 600 is just uh, the number of muscles. But of course, as we know, the muscles are 
subdivided in a number of motor units. So each fiber uh, selects and activates selectively a, a certain number of muscle fibers and these units of behavior then of course are beautifully coordinated uh, in the execution of movement. This is what we, uh, what we see when we, uh, we watch a sport, uh, when we watch tennis, uh, football, whatever. Marvelous uh, way to activate simultaneously a very large number of entities, and these entities, of course, are the motor units. So, right there, uh, we have a problem. And the problem is, how is it possible for any system to be able to control simultaneously such a large space. And this is a problem, of course, that has been with um, the science of motor control for a number of years. Uh, Bernstein, perhaps, was the first person to talk about it and uh, to indicate that uh, uh, this enormous amount of uh, degrees of freedom uh, needs to be somewhat controlled. And the um, and this, uh, of course, the suggestion was made um, that uh, there must be some trick that the central nervous system is using in order to achieve this marvelous function of coordinating simultaneously so many entities, that is, the motor units. Now, this uh, Bernstein, I think, wrote these, uh, um, um, these observations uh, quite a number of years ago. And um, this problem, really, of the large number of degrees, control of a large number of degrees of freedom has somewhat uh, been um, neglected until, uh, until recent times. Uh, I think it's interesting why uh, it has been neglected. Uh, one could say, well, maybe it's a too, too much of a tough problem, and uh, we didn't know, you know how, how to handle it. But I think there is another explanation, and that is that uh, most of the neuroscientists involved in the study of motor control have been fascinated in the years uh, in to, uh, around uh, 60, from 65 to 1970 by the technique of recording single cells uh, from unanesthetized behaving animals. And uh, yours truly has been also in, uh, part of this neglect because I have, of course, spent uh, um, part of my training and part of my career in uh, recording cells from uh, various parts of uh, the motor system. Now, uh, in a sense, this is, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, uh, people get, uh, scientists get attracted by uh, these uh, novel techniques, and um, uh, perhaps without uh, um, sometimes much consideration, they all jump into it, and uh, it's a novelty, and uh, maybe something fantastic will be uh, discovered by the application and utilization of these novel techniques. Well, in reality, uh, after about 20, 25 years of recording single cells in the motor system, uh, the results, uh, uh, there were many results, many descriptive results of correlations between the activity in the cells, of the cells of the cortex, of cerebellum and basal ganglia and so on, but uh, real uh, understanding of uh, the algorithms that are uh, important for the execution of movement still has eluded us. And, um, uh, an example, uh, uh, this is uh, from the work of Georgiopoulos. Uh, he um, followed the, the work of Ed Everts and others, and what he, what, what he did was to show that uh, cells in the motor cortex are directionally tuned. And this is an example of uh, the reported in every textbook. The movements uh, are um, directionally, the cells are directionally tuned. Uh, after this, these observations, of course, there were a number of other observations that indicated the connection between velocity, acceleration, and various uh, positions and so on, various parameters of movement. And one would start to wonder to what extent uh, 
the areas that are receiving all this information encoded by these cells, uh, uh, the interneurons of um, the spinal cord, how confused they might be by these, all these parameters that uh, are projected upon them. Anyway, so uh, in the, um, we uh, in the last, uh, we and, and other groups too, of course, in the last 15 years have focused on a different problem, and that is the problems of uh, uh, and trying to understand how uh, the large spaces controlled, and this understanding goes by postulating first that uh, the motor system is organized in a modular way, and these modules are essentially kind of kind of letters of the alphabet, and uh, then the output of the system is uh, the result of uh, combinations of these modules. This was the hypothesis. An hypothesis that uh, was, uh, in a sense, fortified by uh, uh, the investigations of the spinal cord. Now, the spinal cord, of course, has been a topic of investigation for many years, and uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, activities, uh, lots of investigations uh, were carried on, particularly in Europe, in Sweden, and England. And um, in particular, uh, Stan Grillner years ago uh, indicated that uh, the uh, spinal cord um, was organized uh, along uh, certain dimensions, that is, the so called central pattern generator. So, he indicated that the, the spinal cord had uh, a structure that was uh, important for the production of uh, certain movements like locomotion and so on. And I should say also that uh, the uh, quite important Russian school at that time, Orlovsky, Schick and so on, were uh, responsible for uh, interesting studies of uh, the activities, the production of movement by the isolated spinal cord. So in my laboratory, we focused on um, uh, the um, uh, this is, was a question, as I said, um, and uh, we focused on uh, a, a model system, a, mo a model system, the uh, isolated spinal cord, uh, the spinalized uh, frog. As you can see here, the lumbar spinal cord was um, uh, exposed and uh, uh, with a microelectrode was placed in the interneuronal area of uh, the uh, spin lumbar, lumbar spinal cord. We delivered small pulses of uh, current, very small amount of current, and what we recorded was the forces at the ankle and this uh, um, uh, uh, contraption here is uh, a strain gauge that recorded the forces in um, the horizontal plane. This work was done in collaboration with Franz Sandro Musivaldi and Simon Gitzter, and uh, we uh, recorded the um, following. Uh, I'll give you an example of what was recorded, and was, uh, yeah. So this um, uh, was a preparation that uh, we used. I want to get this point. Okay, so um, the microelectrode was uh, uh, placed in, as I said, in the lumbar spinal cord, and uh, the of a spinalized frog. The ankle was placed uh, sequentially on in these positions here. At each position, a uh, current was delivered, and a force vector was recorded. And you can see here the. Is a, this is an example, of course, the assembly the, uh, of vectors that are the results of placing the ankle sequentially in all these uh, positions. Uh, what you see here is that for the same amount of current to the same location, you see that the vector, uh, resulting vector, is uh, quite 
different according to different positions, which is not surprising because, of course, the force vector is a result of uh, the activation of the muscle or set, or set of muscles plus the moment arm, and as the moment arm changes, the vector changes. And so now we have a, uh, a set of vectors when the, the, with an interpolation uh, just to aid uh, the, the vision. You can see that uh, what is being produced by the sequential activation of uh, the interneurons of the spinal cord in a particular spot of uh, the spinal cord is a force field. A force field, it's interesting, has a structure. These force fields have a structure that is, they have a minimum as it is indicated by the dot here where the force is zero. Okay, so it's, it's at this point. Okay, so then the next step, of course, was uh, to explore the, um, uh, the entire lumbar spinal cord and to uh, see how many of these, if there were different types of force fields as we moved the microelectrode from the rostral to the caudal part of the spinal cord. And, um, the results are represented uh, here in this slide, and it shows uh, that uh, as a minimum, uh, we could identify very clearly the um, four different types of force field. And each one represented, uh, a force, in this case in C, uh, this is a force field that brings, uh, the, uh, this was of course, um, the, the, the leg could not move, but the direction of the vectors, these vectors in C, point toward the body. Uh, in A, the vectors point toward the tail. Uh, frog doesn't have the tail, tail, but in any case, the, 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 and uh, this uh, um, uh, in, uh, in D, no, in, in B, or, yeah, in D, the um, vectors point in a forward direction, and in B, in uh, the, the, toward the uh, a lateral, lateral direction. So, essentially, these force fields are organized with minima in at the periphery of uh, the workspace of the leg. Um, now, um, this was. Uh, an example of uh, a modular organization of, uh, the, um, of the spinal cord. The presence of few modules, this was a quite a surprising uh, experiment, but even more surprising was the fact that uh, um, when we co-actively stimulated two fields, uh, in this particular case, in A, there is a, uh, a force field which was um, uh, evoked by an electrode in the rostral part of uh, the spinal cord, the lumbar, lumbar spinal cord. And in B, uh, it's another field evoked in a different portion of the spinal cord. So two, two, two different fields, as you can see, from the orientation of vectors. Well, the surprising fact, and this was again uh, work done in collaboration with Mosivaldi and Gister, the surprising was that uh, th when uh, the two fields were co-stimulated, so there was simultaneous stimulation on A and B, the, the resulting field was in this particular example here. But when they, uh, we summed vector by vector here the two uh, fields, we found that the difference between the summation and the computation was uh, uh, the two fields, uh, the, the summation and computation were very similar with a high degree of uh, similarity. So what does that mean? It means uh, that uh, the uh, fields, the force fields evoked by the stimulation of uh, the spinal cord interneurons not only have a structure with a minimum, but uh, they combine linearly when there is simultaneous activation. This experiment then repeated by 
Um, I have a collaborator with whom I've done a number of studies, but uh, occasionally this collaborator, who is Neville Hogan, gets uh, fits of um, um, uh, sort of disbelief. And so he took upon himself to repeat all these experiments with much more, many more details and came up, fortunately, with the same result. Um, anyway, so why is this an important thing? Well, because now we have to see these force fields as results, in our case, of uh, the act electrical activation because we used a uh, isolated spinal cord. As, uh, uh, not isolated spinal cord, we used a uh, spinalized animal. But the assumption is that uh, under real behavioral intact uh, body circumstances, they, uh, there, are a, there is a stream of descending fibers from the supraspinal uh, parts of the brain, the command structure. The command structure arrive, arrives at uh, the spinal cord, and of course, uh, it, it may hit a, a different, uh, different part of uh, the lumbar spinal cord. And if it produces uh, force fields, these force fields combine linearly, which is uh, in a great simplification from the point of view of a control structure. So this led to uh, another uh, series of experiments. Now, but before I tell you about this experiment, I want to uh, show you a little bit of uh, where these force fields are generated, and that are the structures in the lumbar spinal cord schematically designed uh, as a result of uh, a study of Philippe Saltiel with uh, an MDA for instead of electrical current to stimulate. But this is the detail. The important thing is that uh, these fields, of course, originate from different structures in the lumbar spinal cord. Now, uh, it's also, so this is a, just a summary. The uh, focal microstimulation of the lumbar spinal cord reveal a small number of circuits that are organized to produce muscle synergies. Of course, the, the force field is a result of muscle activation. So, and by recording EMGs was quite simple, uh, cl clear to see that each of these uh, force fields is uh, implemented by a synergistic activation of a group of muscles that act as a unit. So, um, so the next step now was to, well, this is to tell you uh, that uh, uh, it's not only the frog that is organized, the spinal cord of the frog that's organized in this way, but also um, a number of investigators like uh, uh, the group of uh, Stein at St. Louis uh, has worked on the turtle and uh, has identified a number of modules in the turtle. We have done the work in the frog. Uh, Matt Tresh has done work uh, in, uh, no, in the rat. Uh, other people have identified in the cat, and sorry for the misspelling of aplesia, but uh, um, there is also uh, a very nice uh, uh, work done uh, um, by Weiss in New York, and he uh, identified, of course, uh, aplesia doesn't have a spinal cord, but has group of interneurons, um, and so th they are the equivalent of um, uh, that um, uh, of these modules and it has shown uh, essentially the same, uh, same, same concept that we have seen in other vertebrates. And then in humans I will uh, talk toward the end of my lecture uh, about uh, what we have seen in uh, humans. Um, so now the point is uh, to um, if uh, uh, if we, can, if we assume that uh, in the intact animal, like an intact frog, the supraspinal structure are sending command to the interneurons. These interneurons produce uh, activity in the motor neurons. Motor neurons activate sets of muscles. Can we, this is the question, can we retrieve the evidence for modularity by looking at the EMGs of the muscles of the leg of the frog. This is what we have done in uh, 
by using, um, uh, by making these type of preparations, um, inserting in uh, uh, as many muscles of the leg that we can possibly do, uh, inserting wires and the bipolar wires and recording uh, the EMGs of as many muscles of the leg as possible. So why is this? Well, because then we could observe a variety of motor behaviors in the intact animal, jumping, swimming, and so on. And then uh, simultaneously, on the basis of the EMG activity, we, uh, with, a, with a particular type of algorithm that uh, I will describe in a second, we can uh, extract what we think is the uh, output of the modules that are activated during natural movements. So, um, so we um, uh, developed an iterative algorithm to extract a set of time-varying synergies okay, that minimize the total reconstruction error, and, uh, and I will uh, provide you with a demonstration of that. This was done in collaboration with a, a number of colleagues. It started with um, Andrea Lavella, Matt Tresh, Vincent Chung, um, and these are the people that uh, in the last few years have participated to the intensive exploration of uh, the synergies which were recorded from intact behaving animals. Now let me give you a... Um, so the... the um, these are technicalities, but uh, I just say that, that uh, we collected all the EMGs from all the behaviors, pulled them uh, together, and then applied the algorithm. The algorithm, of course, indicated uh, a certain number of synergies, and uh, we extracted the number of synergies that uh, could explain at least the 90% of the variability. So now, um, let me show you an example of uh, the synergies that we have extracted from the electromyographic activity while the uh, frog is giving kicks in different directions. The kicks are evoked by simply stimulating the skin at different parts of uh, the leg. So here we have uh, three synergies. W1, W2, W3. These were extracted by the algorithm. And uh, the uh, colors, the intense colors, orange or red, indicates that a particular muscle, in this case uh, uh, RI, rectus internus, or SM, semimembranosus, or GA, gastrocnemius, these are, for the synergy one, muscles that are particularly active and less active of course you can see with a with a paler color and with blue color is uh, inactive uh, one thing is clear that uh, uh, the same muscle may be part of uh, uh, different uh, synergies uh, for instance uh, the uh, muscle uh, let's say uh, biceps is obviously active in the synergy w1 and synergy w2 but less uh, in uh, even uh, three uh, and uh, uh, ip, uh, iliopsoas is active uh, in all three of them predominantly in w3 and w2 okay so then what then we use this, uh, this is a, another uh, example of um, the uh, activity of, uh, this is, uh, these are three e examples, uh, three kicks in different direction. Okay? And the gray part is the electromyographic activity of uh, the, these particular muscles. And uh, uh, the algorithm is giving us not only the synergies, but also the coefficient of activations that are indicated here. So uh, for synergy one and synergy three, these are the coefficients of activation. And uh, 
the synergy uh, uh, two, uh, one and three are, let me see to go back, no. Okay, so synergy one is this one, and synergy three is this one. So you, uh, the thick uh, line uh, over this, this thick black line is the reconstructed, um, the, re the reconstruction of the EMGs. And you can see that these two synergies, one and three, with this particular coefficient of activation, uh, reconstruct quite nicely the um, EMGs. The same for a kick here and the same for a kick, the three different kicks. But also you can see that um, the different combinations in, uh, uh, to achieve reconstruction for the kick at the WU1, synergy one and two, uh, one and three are active. For the other kick, which is a medial kick, the reconstruction is uh, due to the combination of synergy one and synergy two. Okay? So here we, we have a, a very important point that synergy one is important in combination with other synergies to, uh, to do the reconstruction. Okay, so this is the idea of compositionality. The same element in combination with other elements uh, gives rise to an output. Okay? And the same thing here uh, for this kick particularly, it's synergy three that seems to be uh, up predominant with minimal amount of synergy uh, one. And again, synergy uh, synergy two is very important in this uh, kick here um, and the, in the um, uh, medial um, uh, kick. So this uh, is an example to show the idea of compositionality, the idea of simplification, simplification of movement by combining that uh, combining synergies we can achieve a particular goal, uh, and, and of course combining synergy with a proper coefficient of activation can reconstruct the movement. So enormous simplification uh, is, uh, is achieved. Now, um, I'll give you this other example, um, because the, in, in this particular case, uh, the, we have five synergies, but we are now examining, okay, uh, the movement of jumping, swimming, and walking. So, uh, whereas for kicking was three synergies were enough here to cover the, uh, um, the, uh, all these different uh, type of movements, we need five synergies. And this is interesting because it shows that uh, uh, for these uh, uh, m uh, movements like jumping, swimming, and walking, they, uh, there is uh, something in common, and there is a certain synergies that are in common, and certain synergies that are specific for that movement. So this is a uh, things that uh, we have seen over and over, that uh, somehow we have the. Um, uh, the, the movements are, uh, the, so there is combinatorics, but there is also a specific uh, synergy for certain movements. Okay. And so, the, the, again, this is, uh, here we have the red line represents the reconstruction, and uh, you, you can see that, um, uh, you can see that, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So in this case, uh, we have jumping, uh, and this jumping is achieved by the combination of synergy three 
and, and then a little bit of Synergy 1 and a little bit of 4 and 5. And Synergy 3 is also part of this um, walking and, um, and Synergy 2 is predominantly for swimming in this case. So, so we, uh, you, you can see uh, by the size of the coefficient of activation what are the combinations that give rise to the, um, to the solution. So, um, uh, now this uh, slide here makes a slightly different point, and that is that um, when um, uh, the, the, these are just the coefficient of activation that uh, uh, controlled the uh, synergy that I've seen, that you have seen before, uh, and just in the situation of walking. But walking in this case goes from D to E to F and G is walking on uh, an incline. So the frog had to move uh, sort of uh, uh, on, on a different incline from a flat surface in D to uh, slightly elevated in E and then more in F and more in G. And you can see that it is the same set of uh, this is just judging from the coefficient and the position of the coefficient. Uh, you can see that there is tuning of the synergies as a function of the increased output force. Okay, so uh, let me summarize the results. Uh, the muscle pattern recording in a variety of natural behaviors can be reconstructed as a combination of small number of muscle synergies. So this is the essence of modularity, the essence of compositionality, that the works of uh, the out output of the motor system is simplified through this uh, particular structure uh, that uh, we have. And there are synergies that are similar across behaviors, as, I, as, I've, uh, as I've shown, and there are few, as I said, few synergies that are specific for each behavior. And uh, then, uh, although it is somewhat a, a contradiction in terms, there are certain synergies that are dominated by uh, a particular muscles, muscle, and, uh, and the, other, uh, the other muscles are uh, almost in the noise, but this is the way it is, and we like to call it that way. Okay, so, um, Recently, we have been concerned with um, 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 what, what uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in, in a complex vertebrate, um, this uh, uh, activity that uh, we have focused predominantly on the spinal cord, um, what, uh, what, are, uh, what is the nature of uh, uh, the cortex? in the context of the generation of the synergies. So we utilized the, um, we did a study uh, in collaboration with Vincent, Vincent Chung and other colleagues in, um, in, in, first in Venice and then the, this work continues in collaboration with Paolo Bonato here at the Spalding Rehabilitation. And, what we were uh, what we were trying uh, to do is to uh, uh, try to get some understanding of how the cortex handles the uh, the, the generation of synergies, and uh, we um, uh, recorded from uh, uh, stroke patients that uh, had a unilateral lesion, predominantly located. Uh, to the motor cortex, and of course, they, um, these patients uh, uh, have one arm which is fine, uh, is uh, uh, normally uh, active and with normal movements, and the other, the, uh, the arm contralateral to the lesion, of course, has some degree of impairment. It depends on how deep the um, uh, stroke is. Um, the idea was to record uh, the electromyographic activity from both the in, uh, intact, uh, unaffected arm and the activity 
electromyographic activity from the affected arm. Because the electromyographic activity, when you see, they were supposed to do the same type of movement, simple, simple reaching movements. Because the reaching movement uh, and the unaffected arm was nothing uh, st standard. Uh, the uh, affected arm, uh, the movement was, um, the trajectory was um, uh, disturbed and um, the posture was somewhat disturbed and so on. So the classical uh, uh, outcome of um, uh, movements in a patient that has had a stroke. But uh, the uh, outcome of the recordings, uh, when we analyzed the extracted synergies, both from the affected and unaffected arm, we found that uh, um, the same synergies could be uh, uh, found both in the affected and the unaffected arm. And this is an example that um, um, we published recently uh, as an example of uh, the uh, great deal of similarities between the two, uh, the affected and unaffected arm. Um, this is a, a different way of representing uh, synergies from the one that I've shown before, but essentially it, it is essentially the same concept where the presence of muscle is indicated by these black uh, uh, lines, and um, so this is nothing particular. So, um, this, uh, this study um, was um, uh, the, the group of uh, uh, Zajac, uh, Lina Ting, uh, and other colleagues uh, most recently did the uh, same, same type of study and they came out with essentially the same conclusion that uh, there uh, is a, a great deal of similarity between the synergies in the affected arm and the fin synergies uh, in the um, unaffected arm. Uh, with, uh, with some difference that the number of synergies in the affected arm is uh, uh, less than, than uh, there are fewer synergies because uh, uh, one, one of the synergies is fused uh, and so the number of synergies is decreased. But essentially it, it is the same, same thing. So this gives an idea somehow and this is what uh, we are very much interested in pursuing. Essentially, two uh, two lines of uh, of, uh, of research. One is uh, uh, through this particular uh, set of patients and with this particular methodology, we can um, pursue. Uh, something about uh, the motor cortex, some aspect of the motor cortex, trying to try to understand what is it that uh, the motor cortex does, what, uh, and um, and uh, we, we, I mean, we are still at, um, at the initial stages of this research, so I, I, I can only speculate a few things, but essentially this is an interesting avenue. The other avenue that we would also like to pursue is, uh, uh, and we haven't done any work on that, but it is something that is uh, very much on our mind, and I'm sure also on other people's mind, is to what extent we can utilize this methodology that identifies essentially the working of uh, the motor system by extracting this synergy, to what extent that could be utilized for uh, uh, therapeutic interventions. I don't know, but in any case, this is what uh, the two sort of two lines that uh, are coming out from this uh, uh, long uh, sequence of work in uh, this uh, area of uh, modularity and uh, synergy. So um, I will um, leave and terminate here, but I like to make. Uh, two considerations. One is that uh, this idea of uh, modularity, combina combinatorics, uh, that there are few elements that combine um, and, and simplify the, uh, essentially the problem of degrees of freedom is, um, I think, uh, 
us and many other groups uh, provided considerable experimental evidence uh, support for this idea. However, I would not say that this is the only way for the central nervous system to accomplish movement. And in fact, there are uh, the group of Zev Reimer and uh, another investigation, Valerio Cuevas, has indicated alternatives. And the alternative is that uh, the central nervous system is um, uh, uh, less involved, it doesn't necessarily rely on these fixed synergies, but the task is what essentially determines the synergy. So in one case, in our, in our case, uh, and as well as many others, it's the central nervous system that has done the job in, uh, the, in, the, in, uh, in these other possibilities uh, um, is uh, the, um, the task, is what the predominance and is the key to the muscles that are used for the particular experiment, for the particular uh, behavior. Now, these two, th uh, well, first of all, the, uh, both the Zev Reimer and Valerio Cuevas, I think that, that they have to bring much more experimental evidence to their ideas. But um, from my point of view, uh, I think it's very exciting that uh, uh, alternatives are put forward. This is uh, the name of the game, uh, to, to have ideas that confront each other. But it's very much possible, given the enormous complexity of the anatomy that uh, subserves motor control, it's possible that a number of different um, schemas are implemented when we move. It's very much possible that in, in certain circumstances, when for highly, um, highly practiced movement, that uh, maybe it's, uh, the task has been uh, instrumental in setting up a set of muscles that is not a particular synergy that it's used in some other context. It's, very, it's possible. It is something that uh, I'm sure is going to be investigated in the next few years. So, um, um, so this is essentially uh, where we are and I will leave you with uh, this very simple schema uh, very simple schema that indicates the supraspinal descending fibers, how they distribute to uh, the interneurons schematically uh, present here and then generate uh, various force fields. This is, this is very, really too simple because we know that also the reflex pathways that impinge on the same interneurons can generate, um, as Lina Ting has shown a number of times, uh, can uh, generate the um, uh, and produce uh, synergies. So, uh, uh, and here are the list of collaborators that I mentioned: Davella, who is now in Rome; G Gitzter, who is in Pennsylvania; Musivaldi, Northwestern University; Saltiel in Montreal; Matresh, Northwestern Universities; and Vincent Chung here at MIT. Thank you. more question concerning the synergies and, uh, of stroke subjects. I'm not an expert in the area, but what you showed on st synergies in the affected and unaffected arm being very similar to each other seems to contradict the work of Jules DeWald. I don't know whether you're familiar, familiar Jules DeWald, who's been doing work on abnormal synergies in stroke subjects and showing that um, the more load you put on their arm, the more abnormal the synergies get, and he explains it by, this, by the patients then using older areas in the brain, which are fundamentally different from the pathways they would normally use. I didn't really get the experiment you were showing, but it looked like the synergies were just slightly modulated, but not completely different. Were you putting very much, very low load on the, on the arms? Mm, no. Now, when you're saying the synergies in your case, the synergies were, extracted with the, 
uh, how with the algorithms that uh, like principal components yes. and this kind of things. He does the same, uh, but but uh, now I who, guess is the setup is who is he? Jules, Jules DeWald. He's at Northwestern University uh -huh. in Chicago, uh -huh. and he he works mainly on s on abnormal synergies in stroke yeah, patients, yeah, yeah. trying trying to find a way to to do therapy whether they should go through these synergies or not. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, well, um, in, in the paper of uh, Valero Cuevas, um, he, uh, he said there, there, there were four synergies and five in the affected arm and five, and five in the unaffected arm. Okay. And the reason why there are four, it's because uh, Four and five are, are fused together, but if uh, you, uh, and we have seen the same thing in our patients. If you separate them, then you have the same number. Okay, except and they argue that uh, one of the problem is that in these patients, some of the synergies lose their independence, and so then it, what gives rise to the particular. Uh, distortion of uh, uh, and and uh, and uh, of uh, of this patient. So this is an interpretation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. I would like to ask a question regarding the relationship between the muscle synergies and uh, Anatole Feldman's equilibrium point hypothesis. Um, uh, when the two attractor fields are linearly summed. Um, a, a local minima appears in the line between the two local minimas of those two attractor fields. When there is, uh, when three attractor fields are summed in the same way, the a local minima appears in the triangular area between formed by the three uh, minimas of the original fields. Um, from this line of reasoning, the equilibrium point can be constructed using the weight of summation of the synergies. Um, the behavior of the equilibrium trajectory is a tractor field ar around a moving um, attractor. This could be constructed using um, a, a theory of changing weight of synergies. Uh, from this line of reasoning, do you, uh, can we believe that uh, linear, uh, uh, Anatole Feldman's equilibrium point hypothesis is a special case of the synergies. Um, yeah, um, I think you are referring to the work of Latash, because Latash has a paper out that uh, in which he puts together uh, equilibrium point and uh, and uh, and synergies in conceptually, and. Um, 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 I, I don't know. I, I've tried to, to understand uh, Latash points, but I'm um, not sure that I do. So I, uh, I don't know. Uh, no problem. I will look Thank into you. the paper. Any other questions? Um, yeah, it seems to me that this, the theories and the work you showed put some constraints on what kind of neural networks could produce this particularly if you add those two force fields or you combine them together, what kind of networks could actually do that? And did you get some insight of this on these networks? Mm. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a very tough question because uh, all, all I can say is that um, um, we can excite the network, which the network that produces this is the interneuronal network of the spinal cord, no question about that. and. Um, and we stimulated that uh, network both with an MDA in order to avoid fiber stimulation, just cell stimulation. This is the work of Philippe Saltiel, and um, in our own work in, um, with, with micro uh, micro currents. To what kind of um, um, uh, interactions between these neurons? Uh, will generate that particular is uh, is, is certainly the um, the anatomy uh, the 
and the, the, of the connections between the interneurons and the interneurons and motor neurons is what determines that. Is, is that something that develops? Is it something genetically specified? And uh, I think it's both, in a sense that um, there is uh, quite interesting work by Lacquaniti. He has uh, um, recorded the electromyographic activity in newborn, in toddlers, and then sequentially in young adults and, and adults. And he has seen that at birth, these uh, newborns have uh, two synergies. Uh, in the, uh, from the leg muscles, two synergies, and these two synergies then persist throughout life. Then other synergies, of course, are added. But the, what is interesting is that adding synergies must, takes a long time, because obviously the development of locomotion in humans it takes a very long time, and this is, I think, it's the com this combination of so. So I think both things are um, the experience, on one hand, the genetic pattern, and then the experience of, um, uh, of feedback and uh, the desire to, um, to walk is what determines the structure of uh, the circuits in order to generate these uh, synergies. But the details of how this is structured, I don't know. And, um, but it's, it's quite interesting. For instance, um, I mean, if one, if one looks at the gym, gymnasts, they work for years and years in order to achieve incredible motor behaviors. Is that achieved through uh, the addition of synergies? Uh, that, that's something that we, we this is we, we tried to see whether in the frog we could uh, subject the frog to a particular type learning schedule, whether we could induce uh, new synergies. Um, somehow it turned out that the frogs <laughs> don't want to learn, at least under our conditions of laboratory. So that experiment, which was conducted by Vincent Chung, was not successful. Um, but in any case, I think it, these experiments are, uh, would be difficult because probably it takes um, the motor system can adapt very quickly and use the same synergies, just tuning them. That's fine. You, you can wait, uh, wait and so forth and so on, you adapt right away. But to learn new skills is very tough. It takes a long time. And no one, as far as I know, has done the experiment of doing, you know, learning of skills over a long period of time in order to see that these skills are really there and not just adaptation. I've been reading quite a bit about synergies, and from most of the paper that I read from the Bala and all these papers that you list out, it seems to me that um, when we are trying to um, decompose into the signal into synergy, we are looking at the um, linear envelope of the SEMG signal. But yes. Um, based on my understanding, um, for SEMG signal, they are basically um, a summation of all the motor unit signals. So um, when I'm looking at that, I'm sometimes confused about um, it seems to me that there is a disconnection there because there might be like some motor unit that we cannot be, cannot be detected from the surface. So how do you look at this issue in terms of synergy? Um, well, um, um, I, I, I don't know. This is something that I, I understand your point. Um, uh, how is it possible that, uh, I mean, with presumably each element is non and nonlinear uh, somewhat, and uh, how come that behavior, when you look at the globally, it becomes linear? This is one, one of those things that, uh, uh, I don't know, defies my, uh, my understanding. Yeah. Any other questions? 